Welcome to the Silverstone LD03. Hello Lady here, we are back and in style with an LD03 courtesy of Silverstone, thank you for sending that over. So, we're going to get straight into the review after a couple of things I mentioned, obviously the things that lots of channels mention. So, uh, one thing that's a little bit rare that I do uh, specifically is timestamps. If you want to skip to any particular part of the video, then please use the timestamps in the video description for anyone on the PC. But if you're a mobile user, the first pinned comment will be my comment with the timestamps in there. Uh, and if I do my job poorly, then one of the very uh, faithful subscribers, um, generally Toto, will pick that up and uh, and put them in there, but I'll try and do my best to do that myself. So anyway, you can go down there to pick up the timestamps. Please use those now and throughout the video to skip to parts you want, including this part of me over explaining the situation, and you could avoid that by using the timestamps below. Also in the video description are Amazon affiliate links to obviously uh, the web page for your specific region, if you want to click on the specific one for, for you know your region, uh, and then if you purchase anything through those with in something like a 24-hour period, it will give a small kickback to the channel. I'll go over other stuff uh, at the end of the video when I do a conclusion, but that's pretty much it. So I hope you enjoy the video. Uh, if you want to check out the B-roll, you might get a glimpse of that machine over there, which I built with my bare hands and some tools uh, over the last six months or so to help out with some camera work. So if you like it, then please like the video I guess if you like that specific part comment on it comment if you like that specific part and I might do a video in the future of how I made the thing uh, and yeah so that's it hope you enjoy the video and I'll catch you towards the end after the uh, the thermal testing the acoustic testing all that sort of stuff uh, uh, for a wrap up Oh, also, I'm doing something different with the wrap-up this time. Conclusion's gonna happen, or the main conclusion's gonna happen in another video. This video is gonna be like a, a light conclusion, but I'll go into an in-depth conclusion of all the bits, pros, cons, missed opportunities in thorough detail in a different video, and I'll link that in the description and probably somewhere here if, if I do that. So, there we go. Let's blast through the packaging. We have a standard cardboard box, hard expanded polystyrene molds, and a bag. So overall pretty basic. I'd perhaps like to see some softer foam here since there's a lot of glass at stake, but it's a light case so swings and roundabouts I guess. I'm leaving the film on the glass till later, it's not worth removing until the end for the sake of avoiding fingerprints alone. The LDO3 isn't entirely square, at just over 23cm deep, 26cm wide and just over 41cm tall, which places it around 25.5 litres. Compared to the other ITX cases on the market, it's a couple of litres smaller than the NZXT H200, about 27 litres, 5 litres larger than the Cooler Master ITX H100, about 20 litres, and a couple of litres larger than the Thermaltake Core V1, about 23 litres. Not that it's in competition with any of them specifically, just more of a reference for size comparisons. But it is worth noting the LDO3 has a smaller footprint than all of them, and most ITX cases generally, so it's an option for those of you who want a proper a desktop setup, if you know what I mean. But if you're specifically looking for that small footprint, the Fantex Evolve Shift comes in at a few litres smaller at around 22 litres, which is a touch cheaper than the LDO3, but both within the 90 to 100 pound range. But the LDO3 is more expensive in America at the moment, so I check your local, local retailers for a better idea around the time you're looking to buy it. The LDO3 is clearly a case that's had a lot of design time spent on the visuals, so we'll have to see if the thermal performance holds up with the lower intakes and top exhaust later. Speaking of which, adjacent to the top exhaust louver is the front or top I.O., which is nothing special including a couple of USB 3.0 ports, headphone and mic jacks, a power button and power and drive LEDs. If you're into reset switches, you might want to look elsewhere. The rear is visually a little different than the sides and front since it's an all steel construction with some ventilation sections. One off to the side for side firing graphics card exhausts, which includes most graphics cards these days, especially the quieter ones, uh, but there's also a lower filtered intake towards the base. Now this isn't a fan mountable intake, by which I mean there aren't any mounting holes for a fan. Sure you could drill some holes and try, but you'd want to find somewhere else to place the power supply unit which this intake solely exists for. Moving on to an actual fan mountable intake, the base has a filter that's held in place with a perimeter of clips, nothing too special. Removing it reveals the pressed steel sections forming the raised platforms for the power supply unit, and below there's a 120mm fan position which is currently occupied by a basic 3-pin 1200 RPM fan. All the feet have rubber pads, and to the right there is something surprisingly useful. It's a cutout that serves as a graphics card installation aid, by which I mean it allows you to poke the back 
end of a long graphics card through here to help get it in position for installation. It's 45mm wide and 130mm long, which allows just over a two slot fairly wide card to fit through. So let's strip this case down. Removing the top panel of this case can be done by pressing some rather crude tabs to the back of the panel and then pulling the panel towards the rear. It's a bit of a handful to do so it shouldn't be that easy to slip off but I think I'd prefer some neatly hidden screws instead. I was going to say it's a good example of where to follow the KISS principle but it does have its benefits although these tabs feel less than premium. The front glass panel is held in place with some fairly light clips, which seem to balance the ease of removal with retention force, but there's more to this panel than meets the eye, well, the initial glance anyway. Next to the male section of the clip on the panel is a square hole, and next to the female section of the clip on the chassis is a circular tab. Pulling on this tab and a matching one below releases the side panel so it can be removed entirely, no screws required. These things are so simple to use and take very little force to operate but are very secure, and you can see why Silverstone opted for the tabs on the top panel, no screws required for access to your system. We'll take a look at the parts bag in a minute, but we'll cover the insides first. So the rear is the motherboard tray with fixed standoffs, which I like, but it does add the risk of losing a mount if you accidentally strip the thread, so be careful about not over tightening your motherboard screws. Up top is the second 1200rpm 120mm fan in an exhaust configuration assisting the natural convection current of the system, and just next to it is a hole for the IO up top. Not the top IO, it's the other IO, it happens to be up top. Not the front one, it's the rear one, but it is also up top, about 10 centimeters away from the, the other top IO. Now, while you can remove the top IO, there are screws up top and inside, there's not really much point in it, uh, because there's no sort of cable management channels or anything that have been designed into the panel. But, if you're in, into minor modding, you could take a hole saw to that protrusion in order to use it as a cable management hole which will match the same cable management hole in the chassis just below it, which all the front I.O. cables are going through. But we'll get into that a little later after the build. I'm not sawing this in half or anything, we'll just look at the area a little more later. Uh, there's also PCI Express slot covers up here and some guides for the top panel. The base of the case is as we saw from the exterior, here's a shot of the fan specs if you need to know them. To one side of the chassis is the power supply unit bracket, now this case is a little unusual as it requires an SFX or SFXL power supply unit and there's no support for ATX power supply units here at all. Uh, unless you want to mod that, but that's up to you. I'll be using the Corsa SF600 which fits pretty well, so anything equivalent including cable length should be fine here. And above the power supply unit bracket is the drive bracket which can support a single 3.5 inch drive or two 2.5 inch drives or a 3.5 inch and 2.5 inch drive. Back to the power supply unit bracket, this can be taken out by removing three screws, not the first one I was removing, which is for the feet or the legs below, uh, it, it was a long day at work. Uh, you also notice later I'll drop all the screws that I unscrew, I'm uh, sorry. Removing the drive bracket requires attention to a couple of screws and posts hold the other side in place. The motherboard tray can be removed as carelessly as you want. Uh, it was a long day at work. For some reason, I removed the other side screws when I wanted to remove the drive bracket, then the drive bracket, and then the motherboard tray screws, discounting that I'd already moved the ones on the other side. Uh, getting the tray out of the way, the I.O. cables were a little fiddly to remove, noting the power supply unit cable is intended to go through here, and the USB 3 cable can't fit into the other hole since it's too small. And we've still got the CPU power cable to send through here, so it's going to be really tight. So there's pretty much the empty shell of the LDO3. Now it's time for the parts bag and then we'll get onto the build. In terms of parts, there's not a lot here. The instruction manual is online and it's not too bad. There's a severe lack of information with regards to cable management, but I really appreciate that they've added information like all of the GPU dimension supported and recommended. That's a really solid addition and loads of case manufacturers don't include that in their manuals. A silly thing to miss out, so well done Silverstone here. Loads of general measurements of the chassis in the component limitations section and decent graphics to guide the user. In the bag we have a couple of spare side panel clips, a pile of screws for the motherboard and 3.5 inch drives, some screws for the power supply unit and 2.5 inch drives, and somehow I misplaced a screw. We've also got some cable ties which I'd prefer to be 10mm thin velcro straps these days which are way more useful and I'd 100% recommend getting yourself uh, a big reel of that. 
and then cable management things for your desk as well. Pretty useful for that too. Uh, and it has got a really nice fan splitter cable included, which is much nicer than the cheap plastic sheath fan splitters that you get online. There's also a warranty sheet that's valid for one year. Uh, the warranty, not just the sheet. The sheet, that could break at any time, and they probably wouldn't replace it. Now for some actual building, let's work out the good and of course the bad. First up is the motherboard which is an ASUS Z170i Pro Gaming with a pre-installed i7-6700K at 4.5GHz and 1.28V cooled by Arctic MX4 and a Scythe Mucan 5 155mm tall CPU cooler. The LDO3 can take up to a 190mm cooler but I'd stick around the 180mm mark to be safe uh, if anything just to prevent it from ripping your motherboard in half. I I'm just joking but I mean what coolers are bigger than that anyway. We also have two 8GB sticks of 2400MHz G-Skill Ripjaws 5 DDI4, all of which is easily installed onto the removed motherboard tray. Of course, with a motherboard comes an IO shield unless you bought yours off eBay, which presents the first issue, the shield, not eBay. And your mileage may vary on this one, not eBay again. With the shield fully installed, which can be double checked by seeing if the notches are on the outside of the case, it would appear the shield is being pinched tight. Width, width way, depth ways, maybe. Uh, so it's forced into a concave or convex form depending on which way you pop it in or out. This only has a minor effect and we'll check it out later when it comes to finishing the installation. But it's worth mentioning to gain an all round impression of the product. Dropping the motherboard tray into position is one of the most challenging parts of this build. Well, if that's one of the most challenging parts, it's got to be pretty good. Well, that's not the whole picture. It's not dropping it in, it's installing it, which is an issue. Sure, you can just throw the screws in and call it a day, but not if you want the best looking results anyway. To get those, you'll want to detach the tray from the case and then use the cable management holes around the VRM to route the power supply unit, USB, audio, CPU, and fan cables if you want, but I need to change the fans out later for more testing, so I'll leave those exposed at this point. I felt I had to remove the cooler to make all this work since I was constantly nudging it with my hand and the last thing anyone wants is some sort of CPU problem later from wrenching on the CPU socket with the cooler and imagine what it would be like with one of those 190mm coolers that this thing can manage. All the cables were run through the larger hole in the tray since all the cables that are worth cable managing are right next to this hole. I don't think there's much point in the other smaller hole, I didn't use it at all. I'd like to see a larger hole for the cable management here, although this is limited by the drive bracket that sits close to the larger hole, but there are a few millimetres to play with so maybe a minor improvement there would be great. Now all of that was sped up and heavily edited, all in all with the figuring out, trial and error, complications with the undersized hole, etc. It took the best part of 30 minutes just to get the motherboard tray fixed into position. Overall that's not awful, but it could do with some improvements. Now for the power supply unit, this is the Corsair SF600. Again, this case only accepts SFX or SFXL power supply units up to 130mm deep, this one being 100mm deep. That'll cost you around $100 or £85 minimum for a 500 watt unit. Uh, EVGA, Silverstone, Be Quiet and Corsair are among all of the cheapest ones around. I recommend getting something with the largest fan as possible, a larger fan as possible, to keep the noise to a minimum. Small fans get louder. I found installing the power supply unit into the case to be a little awkward, sorry for the lack of decent lighting in these few shots by the way, but to shift the side of the power supply unit snug against the edge of the case meant the rubber strip towards the bottom of the case lost the fight, so the exposed adhesive looks a little unsightly. In all fairness, this gets hidden by the graphics card and cables later on, and getting a line of sight with this thing is very demanding, so it's really not worth worrying about at all. So all that's left to do is to secure it in place with a few screws and hook up the pass-through cable which if you didn't know leads through to the top of the case next to the motherboard's rear I.O. At this point we can hook up the motherboard and CPU power cables and replace the CPU cooler. Now for the drives or drive in this case, again with the additional holes on the far side you can install a 3.5 inch or 2.5 inch drive next to the one I'm installing now which for the test system is a 1TB Crucial MX5. Once fixed into the drive bracket, it can be replaced into this case by slotting the lower holes over the posts on the motherboard tray. Then the two screws can be replaced on the other side, which I would have shown you, but I misclicked the record button and then recorded a pile of nonsense instead. But I can show you the connectors going in place, which is nice. Something that is not so nice is the sight of the cables, but there's not a lot that can be done about this. You could try and make it a little bit neater, but it all needs to be bunched up in the end to fit in a full-size graphics card, which makes it really tight. 
Also, I hooked up an NZXT Grid Plus V3, which controls all the fan speeds on the fly, great for acoustically limited testing later. Also, on that note, you can actually use Hardware Info 64 to do the same thing, which I found out earlier today. Now for the graphics cards, on top we have the cover plate and the slot covers, and with those removed, the card can be dropped into position. Remember the hole in the base of the case to the right helps with installing very long 2 slot cards, but won't help you with anything 2.5 slots or thicker. And to confirm, up to 309mm long, which is tight, but the hole to the base does provide a little bit of relief. And if you take the filter out, then you might even be able to go further than the 309mm if you really had to, but again, no thicker than 2, 2.5 two slots I would recommend. And I've got another 50mm of side clearance, which is heaps for nearly any card. This is the EVGA GTX 1070 for the win edition. So if you're thinking your card is really wide and might not fit, which it would be insane as far as I'm concerned, just look at my card and see how much room the difference is, as it were. Something that's really worth mentioning as well in the GPU field is thermal compatibility. My contact at Silverstone has advised that GPUs lower than 200 watts should be completely fine, something like a 185 watt 2070. Their testing has found thermal issues with 200 250 watt 1080 Ti's and 260 watt 2080 Ti's. I can't speak for those results, but I'll be testing with the 150 watt rated GTX 1070 later in this video. While I was returning the panels, I really wanted to highlight these awesome clips again. They are really low effort latches, but this highlighted a problem to me and something that's similar to an issue I had with the LDO1 I reviewed previously. You can just about make out on these shots of the ridge and the shelf that guides the panel into position, but these shots highlight it a little bit better. The finish is noticeably wearing after only a few turns of removing and replacing it. I don't think this is going to peel off or become anything substantial, but it did stand out and it's worth mentioning to me again to get an all-round picture of this product. Now for the power and I.O. Starting with the power, there's a small latch or hatch that needs removing to allow the power supply unit cable to be plugged in, which can be fiddly, but once it's plugged in, the hatch can be replaced and you don't need to worry about it again, unless you want to unplug it, of course. The GPU is no problem, no obstacles here, but back to the rear I.O. and the shield in particular. There's not much of an issue here, just a minor case of the shield being pressed up against the USB connectors and pushing them out by a millimeter or so. Nothing that's going to cause any problems, but I can't speak for whether the shield will develop a more permanent curved shape or not, or anything in between. I'm just reporting my findings, just don't shoot the messenger. So there we go, now just to replace the top panel and we're ready to test. Okay, uh, why does the rest of the case look pretty awesome and this look kind of crap? Well, that's better, but it's kind of like dressing a turd, but since we're all sheathed up, I suppose we may as well go in through the bottom. Panels off, cables through the GPU hole, up through the front, between the gap of the panel and the chassis, and all connected up. Alternatively, get a hole saw and put it straight through that panel in the top I.O., which I suggested earlier. If you're putting this case on your desk, you could put a little bit more detail into the run, but a lower cable entrance is always the way to go if it's on your desk. Just to preface that, people will complain that there should be a high one if you don't have it on the desk, but I agree with that as well. Just both would be nice to be officially supported, is what I'm saying. But it has its own complication. Without modification, there's no way to return the base intake filter. I tried grabbing a few cases off the shelf to see if I could find a stock filter that would just cover the 120mm fan, so I can test with that. But uh, while the Cooler Master and Fantex filters do cover the 120mm intake well, there's no way I can test with this change from the stock setup since it's an unpredictable variable for those who are looking to get this case and want accurate data, or at least semi-accurate data, and leaves a huge gap in the intake under the GPU. So I gave in and returned to the standard stock setup with a sheath though, uh, and returned the lower filter just for testing. And before we get into the test results, I'm also performing tests replacing the top and bottom stock fans with some 2200 RPM fans, EK Varda fans, a sort of premium fan setting. And I'll also be limiting these fans to a moderate acoustic target of 36.5 dBA at 40 centimeters, at least based on uh, my sound level meter, as well as ramping them up to full speed to see if that makes much of a difference. A couple of points on the fan swapping experience. The top fan can be tricky to get out depending on the cooler you're using. If you manage to fit in a macho or something similar, you'd probably have to remove it first, otherwise getting the right angle will just about work. The lower fan was much easier, no access problems whatsoever. 
We'll run through the results in order of test, changing the configuration and seeing what improvements in performance are observable. It's also worth noting that the fan speeds are locked specifically on the CPU and GPU throughout the test, which combined hit a 36.5 dBA on an open air test bench, which may be worth remembering when we're checking out the acoustically limited fan test results at 36.5 dBA. You might be able to tell how much fan speed it takes to make it all that noisy again. But I'll be creating a video on the testing methodology, which you can all check out in the near future to understand the whole setup. Looking to the left, starting with the stock fan setup with a Prom95 and Fermark 10 minute torture test, pretty much as hot as you can expect the system to get. A good test result for those of you looking to use this case uh, with your rendering rig. So we're seeing delta temperatures, as in the temperature difference between the room, the ambient temperature, and the components of 59.9 degrees Celsius, delta T that is, on the CPU and GPU. Just a coincidence that they turned out to be the same. We also saw a down clock from 2000 MHz to 1733, just under 300 megahertz drop on the GPU. To the right are case and cooling stats. In the future these bar graphs will come more and more fleshed out as we continue to review cases like we used to in the good old days. But you can see the noise level, case fan RPM, cooler size and case volume here and that switches around depending on the style of cooling that we're doing and they're always there so you can check them out when you're looking at the performance of each benchmark on the left. Adding in the EK Varda fans, the 2200 RPM fans and reducing their speed down to hit the 36.5 dBA at 40 centimeters target, we see the GPU jump up by one degree which could be considered with intolerance but it's enough to drop the clock speed down down by a further 63 megahertz. However, the CPU decreased in temperature by just over a degree, so really the trade-off by throwing in a couple of nice fans, not that this wouldn't have been the case with the stock fans, and then running them at half speed is keeping the noise level down respectively low and getting some pretty great temps at full load, so really not too shabby. But if you're rendering, you're probably interested in seeing if you can squeeze any more performance out of your system, getting a bit more thermal headroom to push those overclocks. Well, based on my testing, with a fairly high wattage consumer CPU and a large cooler, at full speed you'll gain a few degrees of headroom for overclocking the CPU further, but you'll also gain no benefit on the GPU at all. The fans just don't create any airflow in that section of the case, hence Silverstone's GPU power limit recommendation of just 200 watts. Well, just 200 watts, you can get lots of cards for just 200 watts, but 200 watts. But considering this case is a bit of a showcase, uh, some tempered glass all over, a nice little compact rig, uh, some water cooling probably wouldn't go amiss and that would probably solve your problems of the 200 watt barrier. It turns out there's a lot that can be derived from one test, so let's try and blast through the rest. Cinebench R20 is a high CPU load render over a few minutes, so we're just focusing on CPU thermals here. Strangely, there's no benefit to changing the fans from the full speed stock setup to the nicer Vardas, albeit at a limited speed, apart from the noise level of course, and again this might be able to be achieved with the stock fans, but that's not part of my testing remit. And ramping the speed up on the Varda fans knocked a couple of degrees off the CPU, but since the CPU is nowhere near thermal throttling, there's not much difference in the Cinebench score. Changing things up to a GPU load, Unigen Superposition. Here we see the temperature go from, on the GPU by the way, 45 degrees Celsius with the stock fans, then up to 47 with the premium speed limited fans, and then down to 44 degrees, which is only 1 degree less with the 2200 RPM fans compared to the 1400 RPM fans that was stock, so really not a huge difference. From my testing, you'd lose about 0.1 of a frame on average, and if that worries you, I'd, I'd avoid ever having kids or, or owning a home. Just don't take responsibility for anything. Is, is, I think, my recommendation. The same pattern can be applied to Hitman. There's a slight rise in temperatures going from the full speed stock fans to the acoustically limited premium fans, and then a noticeable drop down just below that of the stock fans with the full speed fans. The premium ones, by the way. Something I fail to highlight is the acoustic compromise you pay for when you replace the stock 1200 RPM fans that have been running at 1400 RPM for me with a more premium set of 2200 RPM fans. Here in Hitman between the stock fans at full speed and the acoustically limited premium fans we see just over a 2 degree increase in GPU thermals while seeing just over a 4 decibel a weighted reduction in noise levels. But going from the stock full speed 1400 RPM fans to some premium 2200 RPM fans sees a 1 degree decrease in temperature on the GPU and a 6 decibels increase in the noise level. So 
not not worth it. If you're still with me, you might be thinking this is just a short benchmark over a couple of minutes. Perhaps a longer, more aggressive benchmark would show some larger cracks. So looking back to the Prime 95 and Furmark test, we see a 4.5 degree difference between the stock full speed fans and the premium full speed fans uh, for a 6 decibel increase in noise levels, which again, I just don't think is worth it. At this point, I've already gone through 800 words on the test results alone, so I'll quickly explain that I have tested with Firestrike and Realbench as well, but only for the 36.5 dBA setup since I think that's the most realistic and recommendable option, and frankly I haven't got the time to do all the tests for all of them, it's just not possible. It's about two weeks in that I've been doing this already. We don't need to analyse these since there's nothing really to compare it against, they are just numbers in a vacuum. So there we have it. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you particularly like the uh, sliding panning shots uh, in the B-roll, then give me a comment saying you liked it or like a comment of somebody else saying they liked it. Um, but yeah, as I said in the start of the video, in the intro, that was a courtesy of that machine that I built um, with my bare hands and some tools, uh, which has turned out relatively okay. It's not perfect. I mean, there is some judder and I could have done some things differently to reduce that kind of impact. But with careful camera work, then you can sort of eliminate that and a bit of post-processing afterwards. It kind of smooths things out pretty well. So I hope you didn't notice any judder in there at least. So there we go. So in terms of the actual main conclusion to wrap up uh, my th all my thoughts on the LDO3, uh, good, bad, indifferent bits, missed opportunities, things like that, I am going to cover that in a different video. Reason why is because I've actually already recorded that bit and I was going to include it in this video, but it was over you know, something like 18 minutes long, something like 20 minutes long um, so frankly I really don't want to put that in the main video because it'll probably deter people from watching the video that's already this long already which is 30 plus minutes so yeah anyway I hope you enjoyed the video obviously you should be able to gain most of the things you could possibly need to know about this case from this video if there's anything I missed please let me know in the comments and if I know I didn't cover it then I'll, I'll answer your questions if I know I've covered it though if I, if I know that I have covered it in this video I just straight out will ignore the message uh, because I, I know smaller channels and I did the same in this previous take I know smaller channels generally more interactive with their audience but once you've when you've spent spent like two more like three weeks on this video for me because I've been I've been extremely busy elsewhere um, then uh, making the video then answering comments you've spent two weeks already answering is just a huge waste of time so i've covered that here in fact maybe i might link to this part of the video if people ask silly questions in fact i'll just ignore it there's no, there's no point that opens me to trolling if you did want to see me water cool in this case because it does look like it's kind of designed that way to uh stick in a stinking big reservoir where if you remove that cpu cooler uh, then i might do something about that in the future in, in a couple of months time once i've done some other work 
But if you're interested in it, please let me know. Anyway, I'm going to leave it at that because the video will roll on too long. Thanks so much. Uh, stick around if you want to or subscribe if you want to check out that, uh, that mega conclusion video about this whole thing. Uh, and otherwise, I will catch you in a future video which will be all sorts of stuff. Might be that bit of equipment there. Uh, might be the uh, Antec DP301 M, which I've had on my shelf for ages. Uh, might be something to do with the lights I'm getting replaced. Um, might be probably just cases, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, and CPU coolers. Cheers, guys. I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.